Well, before I start my talk, I would really uh, like to just repeat a tweet that was done earlier today. And basically, I would just like to say how excited I am to be here today and actually be enjoying the Great Hall for the first time in my life. Um, because actually, just earlier this week, I was sitting a French test just over there. Yeah, it wasn't fun. But um, today, I'm here to speak about the village of Kavuri in Rwanda. And really, this village is not an ordinary place. Um, the people that live here have basically fled the Rwandan genocide back in 1994, the event that eradicated an eighth of the country's population, basically killed one million people. Um, these people have fled into neighboring Tanzania and have lived in Tanzania for the past 16 years of their life. And uh, in 2010, the UN Habitat has recognized these people's desire to come back to their own country, come back to Rwanda. And they've built Kavure for 200 of these people. And um, yeah, so this is where we did our work last year. And I'll tell you more about that later on. Um, so from the picture, really, you can see that Kavure pretty much con consists of absolutely identical houses. I mean, they all look pretty much the same. And although things have changed now, at the time that I first saw it, there was only a single water tank in the entire village that actually supplied the population with access to clean water. But um, what is more than that? You have to picture that a grid line runs just past the village, so literally just 100 meters from the village, but that the villagers cannot connect to this grid line because of the high costs that are inferred by a connection. So people are simply not able to afford it. And instead, actually, uh, to be able to light their homes, the people rely on kerosene lamps, just like the one that I've got here. Uh, so, I mean, it looks quite nice, but um, it really isn't because there are two major problems with these kerosene lamps. And the first one is that the people actually spent 40% of their monthly income on buying the kerosene needed to fuel these lamps. Now, if you think about it, I mean, over here, how much are you spending on your, on your energy bill a month? It, I bet you it won't be 40%. Um, and the second problem, and that is actually what is much worse is that these kerosene lamps emit toxic fumes. And uh, actually, these toxic fumes has been, have been estimated to be the equivalent to the smoke inhaled from two full packs of cigarettes in a single day. Now, uh, just imagine smoking two full packs of cigarettes. I'm sure there's some of you out there who do that. But <laughs> um, yeah, just do this in involuntarily, so to speak. And in fact, actually, the, the UN Development Program and the World Health Organization have estimated that every single year, the indoor air pollution, which is caused by these kerosene lamps, leads to a staggering 1.6 million deaths around the globe. Now, if you think about it, that is pretty much one life lost every 20 seconds, or six lives already during the time that I've just spoken to you. So, I mean, obviously, the UN Habitat realized last year that something had to be done about this problem in Kavure. And they were really looking for an organization with both the knowledge and the experience of working in Rwanda to carry out an electrification project in the village of Kavure. And who they found, uh, actually, when they were looking for that someone, was a bunch of undergraduate students here from Imperial College. And uh, I'm, I'm part of that bunch, and we like to call ourselves Equinox. And actually, there should be a lot of us up here, maybe cheer or something. <laughs> Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, so what are we all about? Basically, what we're, what we're aiming to do is to make a difference, really, to people's lives, not only after we've graduated from college, but already during the time that we're in college. So we're aiming to use, really, the knowledge that we've gained in the classroom to make an impact to people's lives already now. And uh, how we do it is by installing these things called energy cures. It's a, it's a very sim simple concept. Um, basically, it's just a building with uh, solar panels installed on the roof. And actually, that picture was uh, taken in Kavura. And the batteries, like the one that you see in the center inside, um, where the batteries obviously get charged by these solar panels. And then people can take these batteries home, connect them to LED lamps, and thereby have a safe and affordable access to lighting. Now, by last year, we already had three of these energy cures installed in rural Rwanda. And I'm quite happy to say that now it's actually uh, four in Rwanda and one in Tanzania. And um, actually, 
the, the one edition in Rwanda was the one done in Kavure. Um, so we did this last September, and actually the first time that I entered the village of Kavure last September, um, I got a bit of a strange feeling about the whole thing. I didn't feel quite right about just installing this energy, energy cures as we had usually done. Because when I entered the village, there was some sort of a social tension between the villagers. The, I could feel that something was not quite right. So I actually went up to one of the locals and I asked him, you know, what was going on in your village? Is there something wrong here? And he was basically telling me a story about how recently actually another villager had stolen a lot of water from the local water tank which they were having, not only causing a shortage of water in the village, but also ridding the population of the necessary income that they would usually get from uh, actually selling this water. So the result of all this was really a feeling of mistrust be between the villagers that could be felt at any moment. So I was thinking rather than to you know, just go down there, install our usual energy cures, we should also really m try to make our project work from a social point of view, really reconnecting the people uh, back to one another. And um, I spoke to the team about this, and they all said that this was a great idea. And w so what we came up with was uh, this concept of responsibility sharing. Basically, um, it is something that will, that will share the, the responsibility. So, sorry again. Um, so all the villagers will share the responsibility um, for the energy kiosk. And doing that, they will interact and actually regain trust in one another. And just like this responsibility sharing idea, we also had a whole bunch of other ideas which we really thought could make this project work. Now, I can't go uh, into the details of all of them, but <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you that obviously we hadn't yet spoken to the locals about what they actually thought about these ideas. Uh, but when we did, pretty much this is what was left of it. So actually, 80% of our ideas got totally scrapped, um, simply because the locals were saying that this is not how things are done in Rwanda. Um, so for example, our idea of responsibility sharing didn't work in the end because the locals were saying that there always needs to be a single person of authority to um, guard the kiosk and to be shopkeeper of the kiosk. Um, but that is not really my point. My point is that actually these remaining 20% of our of ideas have actually made our kiosk a huge success ever since our shopkeeper John has opened it up. Not only supplying the people in Kavure with safe access to electricity, but also opening up the kiosk services to people even from other villages. Now my point is that really only by stepping out of our comfort zone, which is this university, and by recognizing a problem on the ground in Rwanda, have we been able to improve these people's lives. Now, only by not actually being afraid to fail in the process of applying our knowledge, but at the same time by being open to listen to those locals on the ground, have we been able to make this kiosk a success? And actually, I think using these tools, not only we in Equinox, but students from you know, all around the world, I think could make a huge impact to people's lives. Um, as was said earlier, actually, uh, in Equinox, there's only 40 of us, so you can imagine this little guy represents 40 people, right? Um, and and uh, as was said earlier, these 40 people uh, have had an impact of 2,000 lives over the past three years alone. So you can only really try to imagine what would happen if it's not just 40 people, but say everyone in this room would aim to do the same, or everyone at this university would do, aim to do the same. In fact, if every single person at universities in the UK alone would aim to do the same. Thank you. <laughs>